webinar today will actually was originally to be um, presented by uh, Mr. Chris Haugen, but he is actually out, so I am standing in. I am Brennan Gallagher Watson. I am a uh, the creative director of this company, but I also started here as a uh, researcher, and so I have a bit of a background in, in what we're talking about today. Um, what we are talking about today is management of vascular wilts. We're going to be focusing mostly on Dutch elm disease, and then we're going to move into sycamore anthracnose and talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the ways that we manage these, uh, these uh, fairly uh, destructive diseases here. Our housekeeping notes that we start with. Uh, if this is your first time attending one of our webinars, welcome. Uh, if they are not, you kind of know the drill. To earn a CEU for this, we request that you put your ISA certification number into that little questions box that you'll see on your little uh, uh, go to webinar toolbar there. Uh, if you have questions throughout the uh, presentation, what you'll do is actually type them in there as well, and then uh, we will. Sometimes we uh, catch up with the questions at the end, but oftentimes we just follow up with folks after because um, usually they're more involved than something we want to type back to you. Um, we are recording this webinar, and these recordings will be posted on uh, Rainbow's website as well as the YouTubes of the world um, within a few days of this. So if it's something that's of value to you and you'd like to share it with others, or uh, it was so great that you wanted to relive it again, uh, you're welcome to do that uh, at a later date. What we're going to be talking about today, like I said, is mostly about um, Dutch elm disease and sycamore anthracnose. And what we're going to be kind of trying to focus on is how do we know that a tree is a good candidate for treatment? What are our treatment strategies and sort of our expectation of results? If there's other cultural practices that go along with these, most of these types of problems we're talking about aren't just oh, we'll inject it with this fungicide and boom, the problem takes care of itself. You can, we'll kind of talk about how the uh, management protocols have, have a multi-pronged approach to them. And uh, at the very end, I'm going to touch a little bit on the, the kind of the more, you know, real world side of getting out into the field and doing this. How can you be more efficient with your treatments to make them more profitable and successful for you and for your uh, clients' trees? So first, like I said, we're going to talk about Dutch elm disease. Uh, Dutch elm disease is, in my uh, 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 my experience, probably the most impactful plant health care problem in North America, without a doubt. Um, it's probably the, when I tell people what I do, Dutch elm disease is one of the easiest ones to get a nod out of them. Like, oh, I've heard of that. Um, not everybody's heard of, um, you know, like a, uh, walnut canker. But Dutch elm disease is one of those you can lead with and people know what you're talking about. So uh, Dutch elm disease uh, was first introduced into the United States in the 1930s. They actually know specifically where the, the, the location was. It was a furniture manufacturer in Cleveland, Ohio that um, had actually imported some logs from France unknowingly uh, were already infested with both uh, European bark beetles as well as the Dutch elm disease fungus. So that was in 1930. By the 1970s, it had spread across the country throughout the range of the American elm, and by the mid-1970s, it was estimated to have killed 77 million trees. And now it's basically found throughout the range of the American elm. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is a fungus. My little, my little toolbar thing keeps popping up here. So it is a fungus, Ophiostoma nova ulmi. Uh, it's changed names several times, but that's the one that we're going with for now. That electron scanning microscope picture you see there, that's a real close-up of basically what's at the very tip of these little pycnidia here. So at the very tip of these things, these gold um, little structures there, those are actually the spores. So they're picked up by beetles and vectored from tree to tree by these bark beetles. Now what it's doing to the tree is the fungus itself causes a response in the tree that gums up the water conducting tissues causing the wilt symptoms that we see. So the tree looks like it's dying of, of drought in midsummer. Um, think of it kind of like a, like a stuffy nose. Like when you get a stuffy nose because of a reaction to like breathing in ragweed, it's not like ragweed pollen is, is gumming up your nose, it's your body's response to it that's causing the stuffy nose. It's, very similar to what's going on with uh, with Dutch elm disease here is 
it's not the fungus itself that's actually slowing down the flow of water in the tree. It's the tree trying to stop the fungus. It gums up its own water conducting tissue. So basically, like I said, it's the host's response that's actually causing the issue, um, not the fungus itself. Why is Dutch elm disease such a big deal is, you know, go back 50 years, just about every suburban community in the country, uh, if their elm could grow there, this is what they looked like. You know, the, the Elm Cathedral Boulevard is so iconically American that you can show a picture like this and we can't tell, we know for a fact this is from, from the United States, but you don't know if this picture was taken in Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, uh, upstate New York, Minneapolis, this look, you know, the, the way that the elm tree was planted along the American boulevards is such an icon of, of the, you know, American suburbs that, like I said, you literally couldn't even tell where in the country a photo like this was taken. There were so many elm trees and they were such a part of the landscape that as they started to, to come down, it really had a dramatic effect. You know, I mean, here's the corner of this house and then here's the corner of that same house. The way that it impacted the, you know, these trees were large. You know, this you know, Dutch elm disease um, uh, gets brought up a lot when people are talking about emerald ash borer because emerald ash borer has a similar kind of you know like landscape changing effect. But even emerald ash borer can't quite compare to the impact that Dutch elm disease had just because of a the, the number of these trees, the size of these trees, and by the time these elm trees were coming down, most of these trees were 50. 60, 70 years old, so they're quite large, so the loss of them had a dramatic impact on the look of the landscape. This slide always blows me away, and what it is is actually the number of public elms removed um, during this 30-year span just in the city of Minneapolis. And look here at 1977, there's about 32,000 full-size American elms came down that year. I mean, you start doing the math on, on what a project it would be to remove that many trees. And like I said, even, even Emerald Ash Borer can't even pale in comparison to, to the impact of these elms. I did the math, and if you were to work crews um, basically in 24-hour shifts, you would still have to take down about 800 trees a day to keep up with the removal impact in, in the late 70s here. And again, this is just one community. And um, and so, you know, the, the numbers go down significantly after that, but still they're in the, in the thousands, you know, like the, the, the bottom line there is still like 5,000 lost trees a year. And, and again, these are trees that were 30, 40 inches in, in, in diameter. They were large full size trees. So trying to think about where would you even put the removal waste from 30,000 full-size trees in a, in a summer. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. Um, and I can remember my, myself as a, as a child having Dutch elm disease come on our, our street, and within five years, the tree line canopy that, that I grew up on was completely changed, and now, you know, 30-some years later, that boulevard now has a mix of multiple species on it, but they're all much smaller than they were. Um, you know, that, that street looks significantly different than it did when I was a kid. So Dutch elm disease, as I mentioned, it is a fungus, and this fungus moves from tree to tree in two ways. Um, the primary way that it moves is through elm bark beetles. So what will happen is the bark beetles bite into the two and four year old branches, two to four year old branches up in the canopy. Uh, the disease gets introduced, the fungus starts to grow, and then the tree becomes weakened, and basically it's advantageous to the bark beetles because as the tree is weakened from the fungus, it's now a more suitable house for the, uh, the, the beetles to raise their young in. So the beetles and the fungus kind of have a symbiotic relationship where one's getting spread from tree to tree um, by the beetles, and then the beetles get the benefit of the tree being weakened and becoming a more suitable habitat for them. The other way that it can move is elm trees in close proximity, like a lot of other species, will form root grafts together. So because because this is a you know, physically growing fungus, it can literally grow through the root system of one tree into the root system of another and, and take down that tree. So we can actually, just by looking at where the symptoms are appearing on the tree, we can know how, the, that, um, how that fungus got into that particular tree, right? And if you look at those numbers on the bottom, about nine out of 10 trees that die of Dutch elm disease get it via what we call overland transfer. So basically they got it by a bark beetle picking up spores from, from an infested tree, an infected tree, and bringing it to a healthy tree, biting into it, and starting the process. 
Um, it can grow through the root systems, and we'll see when we talk about management in a bit. There are times where the fact that it can grow through root systems can be a, a, a pretty significant challenge for, uh, for managing this in the urban forest. How do we know a tree has Dutch elm disease? It actually has some pretty um, uh, characteristic uh, um, symptoms that it shows. So after a beetle were to bite into the canopy here, um, the fungus begins to grow. Um, like I said, the response we see from the tree happens a little bit after. So as the fungus is growing, the tree is trying to react by gumming up its conducting tissues to try to slow down the growth of the fungus. These usually happen about four to six weeks after the initial infection. We'll see a wilting or a flagging. Um, that's what we're seeing on the tree here, where we see this one yellow limb starting here. That's starting at the branch uh, tips where the basically the, the beetle bit into it, and now this fungus is growing its way down the tree here. As that happens, we start to see this really, um, you know, this is why it's you know, um, known as a, a vascular wilt, is the tree literally starts to wilt. It literally starts to look like it's dying of drought in the middle of summer, isolated to a small part of the tree. So that's why you know, it has that flagging appearance to it. And um, when, we, when we look at the tree, that last little note there where it says using leaf symptoms alone to decide where the uh, leading edge of the infection is doesn't work because the fungus is actually quite a bit further than where you're seeing symptoms in the tree because there's always a lag period between the fungus getting there, then the tree responding to it, then you start to see the symptoms appear. One of the other characteristic symptoms is a streaking um, that, will, uh, that will appear under the bark. This photo um, on the uh, screen here was taken two days ago by one of our climbers uh, here in the, uh, the, the Twin Cities area in Minnesota. This tree had very kind of like, a, I guess you'd say like mild looking symptoms. It was one of these suspect trees. Um, you know, they took a look at it a couple weeks ago and decided to send a climber up into the uh, up into the uh, canopy here, and even though the tree didn't have these really significant wilt symptoms quite yet, you can actually already find the streaking uh, appearing. And the streaking, again, is a host response to it. So the streaking you see there, this brown uh, lines, that's not actually the fungus, that's the tree trying to stop the fungus. So um, you can see how small that little twig is. So, you know, this tree, might be a candidate for, um, for what we're gonna uh, talk about in a little bit, um, try tracing where we can actually cut the fungus out of the tree. But oftentimes by the time we see the fungus actually causing this effect on the tree, it's often too late. So our management protocol, um, you know, finding this, you know, I just said, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we observed a, um, a, a part of a tree that looked suspect. Um, so we went back and, um, and, and checked it out, and turns out this one did. Um, and that leads to the second part of, of the management protocol, which is prompt sanitation. Literally, getting diseased trees out of there um, has actually been very successful in a way of slowing down the, the progression of the, the spread of the disease, because basically if there's no um, infected or yeah, infected trees around for a beetle to pick up the fungus from and bring it to another that can really help reduce the amount of, of, um, of disease that we have in an area. Isolation is the process of physically separating the root grafts um, between the, the an, an infected tree and a healthy tree. And tracing, which is a process we'll, we'll touch on a little bit here, actually that's going into a diseased tree and physically cutting the fungus out of, out of the diseased tree. And then protection, which is going to be, in this case, using macro infusion uh, with Arbortex to, um, to um, basically prevent the fungus from getting started in the tree to begin with. We'll cover all this here in a second. So sanitation, like I said, it's pretty straightforward. Here's another one of these you know, pictures of what you know, the impact of this was in the, I think this photo is from like 82 or 83. And just look at the size of those, of those trees. I mean, again, the amount of, of wood debris just to have, find the space for all this stuff. I mean, it's remarkable. And obviously in 30 years, our uh, you know, PPE has uh, improved greatly from the uh, shirtless, uh, hulky guy uh, removing a tree there. Um, but yeah, every tree on this block was an elm tree. As Dutch elm disease came in, every tree on this block was lost in a short period of time. Isolation is the process of physically uh, disrupting root grafts. So depending upon the the, the situation, most commonly we do come in with uh, these um, like a, a ditch witch type of uh, trenchers like that. We use a vibratory plow uh, that cuts about 
three and a half to four feet deep between these two trees. And um, these are the situations where um, we actually still do this frequently. I mean, we were literally on a property just last week here in, in Minneapolis doing this where one neighbor had a elm tree that they've been protecting for years. Adjacent yard has an elm tree that was not protected. That tree got Dutch elm disease. Homeowner didn't remove it promptly, and the city didn't remove it promptly. So that tree now is a standing dead elm tree. So the neighbor who has been protecting their elm tree hired Rainbow to come out and do a trench between the two for just this reason. That, um, as we'll see, uh, even though the Arbortect fungicide is very effective against preventing Dutch elm disease, it only protects against beetles bringing it to it. It will not protect against the uh, the rootgrass spread. So, um, so this is still a common practice that we, you know, like I said, up, up until last week, we were literally doing um, some uh, some root graft separation between a diseased tree and a healthy tree. Uh, here's a good little model to sort of understand, you know, kind of what we've been showing. So here's my my healthy elm tree. Beetle comes and bites into a branch high up in the canopy. That fungus begins to grow in a predictable manner down the branch that it was originally uh, introduced into. That results in that branch flagging, which is what we see in, you know, in the, the you know, just a chunk of the canopy starts to uh, exhibit these wilt symptoms. If that fungus continues to grow and it gets all the way down to the base of the tree, at that point it will kill the entire tree. Right? So there actually is a time in here where we can come in and just like you can physically cut cancer out of out of the human body when when it starts to begin to grow there's a time that we can actually get in physically cut the fungus out of this tree and it's this process that we do called tracing so basically what you'll do is you determine where the the fungus was entering in so basically following where the um, where the wilting symptoms were showing it says we here that we cut little small windows in the bark. So what we're doing is we're actually looking for that vascular staining um, that um, that as the as the fungus is growing, you'll actually see this vascular staining um, appearing. So we're literally cutting little windows in the bark, trying to find where the end of that that staining occurs. And as we said before, the tree's response is always delayed from where the actual fungus is at. So if we find staining within 10 feet of the ground, we know that that fungus has actually grown all the way down into the root fair area, and at which point that tree cannot be saved by tracing. So um, this tree here that you're looking at, where you can see that stain going all the way down to the ground, that one's clearly not a candidate for, for tracing. I feel like older presentations we would do about Dutch elm disease, because tracing is a process that was um, pioneered and basically invented by one of our arborists here at Rainbow Tree Care, and it has been used successfully. We have standing trees that were traced back in, I think, 87 is one of the oldest ones that's still, that's still around, and it worked. And um, we used to spend a lot more time in our presentation sort of going over um, the process of it, how to price it to a client and all these things, but what we kind of realized it was giving the impression was is that, well, if a tree gets Dutch elm disease, you can save it. Well, some trees, and in very rare situations, and also keep in mind, you're sending a climber, you know, for a you know a couple hour job to do this um, exploration that in the end might end up condemning the tree anyhow. And so, um, so nowadays I really try to like you know tone back, you know, how we're sort of talking about tracing that it is absolutely a, a an option there, but it's not something that every time you see a disease elm tree you should approach a client and say, oh, I've got a uh, process now that can save a tree from that because it can work, but it's not a high success rate. And um, if you do want more information, oh, my my weird, uh, um, I don't know if it's showing as a weird black and white thing for you guys, but I actually do have a sheet we created a few years ago that kind of has a um, like a protocol on 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 how tracing works and how you can use it. Um, I apologize, the uh, the PDF looks goofy on the screen there, but if this is something you're interested in, even just for your own information, let us know and I'd be happy to send over this PDF um, in a much more legible form for you. Uh, so you can take a look and, and sort of see what's involved. And it's also a good one to use while talking with customers about, here's a process that could work, but as you're kind of explaining why it, you know, what, what the tree's gonna look like, even if we cut all this stuff out, um, the cost of it, um, all that stuff are considerations that need to be taken place before um, you start sending climbers up, cutting windows in, looking for a vascular stain. Um, so we kind of get into, now we're looking at management. And what you're looking at on the screen there is what we used to do for management. Uh, if the disease is being vectored by beetles, boom, just spray for the beetles and everything will be okay. Um, 
you can actually see these are rainbow tree care trucks on a golf course. These are probably from the, the, the mid 80s. So this practice was, you know, still part of our protocol, you know, kind of well into the modern age of our culture. Uh, but uh, not terribly successful when it comes down to it. In, in some ways, um, uh, insecticides actually were fairly effective. In other ways, they were very detrimental. You know, for a long time, for, you know, the spraying for the insects was the number one way to protect against animal disease. From about 1930 up until the 1970s, DDT was the product they were using for, um, for uh, uh, spraying for it. And obviously, if you know anything about environmental science, there was a backlash of you know, problems unforeseen about DDT. And also turns out, for protecting against Dutch elm disease, remember what I said before, there's these tiny little beetles and they're biting the two and four year old branches up in the canopy? How in the heck can a guy from the ground here ever spray the tree completely enough that every single branch on this tree was, was covered uh, to prevent the, uh, the beetle from, uh, from passing the, the disease? The other thing is, is a beetle might have already landed on the tree, bitten into the tree, transferred the fungus into it, then the day later we came back and sprayed the tree for, for the, the, um, with an insecticide, killing the beetle. But it still didn't do anything about preventing Dutch elm disease. So, um, so we do not uh, spray for Dutch elm disease anymore. Instead, rather than trying to focus on stopping the vector from moving the disease from tree to tree, our efforts now are focused exclusively on just stopping the growth of the fungus. And that's where um, Arbitect and Macro Infusion come. So um, the, the idea behind Macro Infusion is we're basically putting a, a, a really high volume of water into the tree with this fungicide mixed in. And the idea of why you need a high volume of water with this is, as I just said, you need to get every little branch up in the canopy completely covered with this stuff because if you only got about 50% of the canopy covered, then that means 50% of the canopy is still uh, susceptible. If you've got 90% of the canopy um, uh, covered, there's still, that means one out of every 10 branches up in that canopy could still be a place where one of these beetles could bite into a branch and introduce the fungus in. Um, so you can kind of see in this picture here, um, this is uh, this year's growth rate. Right? So the idea with macro infusion is basically we wait until the tree is in full leaf. Um, so in our neck of the woods, it's about Memorial Day. And another good guideline for Dutch elm disease is basically wait until the elm has dropped its seeds for the year. And then you know that the tree has already put on a growth ring for this year. And then by macro infusion, we're basically drilling into the tree and introducing the solution in and getting it right into um, the xylem layer here where it's then distributed throughout the canopy. Uh, Arbortect is the fungicide we've been using for about 30 years on, um, on Dutch elm disease. Um, it is applied through macro infusion. And why we use Arbortect over some other products is Arbortect is one of the few products that we know actually will move into new tissue. So we just saw in that last slide how there's, there's a new growth ring here. Um, next year, the tree will put out another growth ring, right? Arbortech will actually move into that new growth ring and it'll last for about three seasons before it needs to be reapplied. Um, how do we know this is uh, Rainbow has been involved in Dutch elm disease research um, since the early 80s. And what you're seeing here is actually um, up in the canopy, different trees treated with different products at different rates at different time of the year, mixed with different volumes of water. And then we actually went in and physically injected the Dutch elm disease fungus into the plant to try to mimic what it would be like if a beetle was, uh, was introducing this and evaluated which of these products was actually lasting, um, was lasting and um, were the most effective. So we would actually come back, we'd treat a tree with, with multiple products and then come back over several years and keep inoculating it with the fungus to see how long the product was lasting in the tree and seeing which ones of these were most effective. Uh, this has been going on for quite a while. Um, I love the, uh, the uh, old school pick of these guys in their tweed jackets out there doing some macro infusion. I think that would be a sweet brand niche for our company to take on, being like the old timey tree care. But anyway, uh, but you can see that picture is actually, even though it looks like it's you know turn of the century, that was really actually from the 60s. Those are a couple of researchers at Princeton doing that, uh, that research there. Um, through the 70s, they started looking at different mixes of fungicides. By the 80s, we actually had um, Arbortect on the market, and Arbortect became sort of the industry standard for 
for the reason of that I just addressed that it lasts for multiple years. Um, you can see we use the basically the process hasn't really changed in about 35 years now. Um, the uh, the um, we have crews out today probably going to get another 30 or 40 trees injected you know today in the Twin Cities. So elms remain a a major part of our our urban forest partly because especially in the area we live in. Some of these trees have been protected now for, for 30 some years. Um, we get quite a lot of questions about Arbortect versus Alamo. Um, Arbortect and Alamo are um, uh, both injectable fungicides. Both of them are used in vascular wilt diseases. But there's a reason that, and also both of them are products distributed by Rainbow Tree Care, so this isn't a, you know, we protect one product because it's a proprietary product to us. Um, we actually do distribute both these products. Um, both of them are, are applied by, um, by tree injection. Alamo can be applied by, um, uh, by macro infusion and micro infusion as well. Um, the dosing is not really the important part. What really gets down to the important part here is this last little bit where, um, the Arbortect is the only one that will last for multiple seasons. And the kind of argument is, well, what's the big deal? Can't you just come back and treat it the following year? Um, you can't. <laughs> and here's sort of why is um, why we, we recommend Arbortect over propiconazole, which is Alamo, is um, propiconazole cannot move into new wood. Um, and so, as we just said, there's a, um, there's a, um, the, the beetles are feeding way up in the canopy on these young branches. So if I inject the plant with a product that lasts for one season, by the time the, um, the tree is in full leaf the following season, the beetles have actually already been out for several weeks. And so by the time we would actually be able to go in and do a treatment on this tree the following season, the beetles could have actually already um, transferred the disease to it. And, um, and here's a, another graphic that might be hard to see on your screen. This is another one I'd be happy to send you um, if it would be of interest to you. But there's an impact beyond just the, um, the the cost of one fungicide or another, or the time of doing it or something. You know, there's another cost that's involved to this tree as well because we're we're talking about macro infusion, which requires drilling into the hole, um, drilling holes into the tree rather. And um, so if you look at over over one season, it's not that big of a difference. If we look at you know, the impact over, you know, let's go with, you know, you know, nine or ten years here. Um, this is also based on Rainbow Tree Care's pricing. So um, another way that other tree care companies will market Alamo treatments to a customer is, well, it's less expensive. Look, it's, just, you know, 530 bucks to treat your tree with, with that product, and it's only 300 to treat your tree with this product. Well, as we said, that product only lasts one season. So if you're an ethical arborist and you're actually providing um, annual treatments on this, the accumulative effect on these trees over time, um, for one, say over nine years, I'm injecting into um, this tree Arbortect, I've put 135 drill holes into this tree. If I was coming back every season and injecting um, propiconazole into this tree, I'll have put 405 drill holes into this tree without enough time in between these treatments for the tree to part, you know, compartmentalize over this. And really over time too, um, the cost to the homeowner is actually significantly higher as well. So, um, so again, there's, there's reasons that we, we recommend macro infusion, even though we're a company that makes micro infusion equipment. And there's reason that we recommend one particular chemistry over another, even though we might actually carry both of these chemistries. So here's our, our, our key distinctions on, on Dutch elm disease. If you can kind of get these, you can really sort of understand the whole story about, about why the, the management protocol for Dutch elm disease is as it is, is Dutch elm disease entering into those two to four year old twigs up in the canopy. You must have complete distribution of the Arbortect for effectiveness. So if we're using smaller volumes of water, there's no possible way in a full size elm tree that that product can get evenly distributed amongst the entire canopy. That's why we need this super high volume of water, hence macro infusion. And the product needs to be reapplied every three years. So um, if these steps are followed, um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, around town here that have been um, that have been rainbowed customers for over 30 years. So they're on their 10th cycle of macro infusion treatments. The plants are doing just fine. They haven't decayed out from the bottom. They're not about to fall over because too many drill holes have been put into them. And some of these trees are, are have gone on to be 
very large, <laughs> very successful looking plants. You know, there's a golf courses around here that have hundreds of elm trees still left, full-size elm trees that are 100 years old now that survived the major wave of Dutch elm disease through, um, through the 70s and 80s and are still kicking today because they're under protection and, um, and um, like I said, our, our applicators and our, and our team have been, um, have been rigid about following the same protocol for managing these trees for, for this many years. So we're going to switch uh, gears a little bit from uh, Dutch elm disease and talk about a, an, another um, disease. This one, rather than affecting elm trees, of course, sycamore anthracnose infects um, uh, uh, sycamore trees. Where I live in Minnesota, sycamores are few and far between. They're sort of out of their, their host range here, um, or they're sort of out of their native range, and yet we probably still have you know, like, you know, a small, you know, there's probably still thousands of, of sycamore trees here in the Twin Cities. I'm always surprised to see that these trees have sycamore anthracnose here in the Twin Cities. I'm thinking, how, you know, the, it's crazy that throughout the, the, the range of, of the host, the, uh, the disease will be there as well. So sycamore anthracnose, um, if you've ever seen it, it's, it's pretty distinctive on, on a, a sycamore tree. Um, what it does is it uh, causes cankers. So let me back up. Um, most uh, most uh, foliar diseases that are classified as anthracnose um, diseases, anthracnose is sort of a class of, of type of infection we see on a tree. And anthracnose isn't like a, like a um, taxonomic family. So there isn't like every anthracnose is related to each other. Uh, anthracnose is sort of a general term we use for different foliar or fungal diseases, right? So sycamore anthracnose sort of differentiates itself from other anthracnose diseases in that it doesn't just affect the leaves. We actually have um, a, a problem that happens with sycamore anthracnose where the fungus itself starts in the leaves, grows down into the twig, and on the twig it causes these cankers those cankers become the source of more spores coming out and reinfecting more leaves on it. So over time, the, the trees look worse and worse. Um, and it actually starts causing witches grooming and such that we'll see in a little bit that really start to affect both the aesthetics of the tree, the, um, the um, structural integrity of the tree, and also weakens them significantly so they become more apt to you know, suffer from other secondary diseases. Decay is already an issue on, um, on sycamores, and now you introduce a, a um, disease to it that's furthering its, um, the, its weakened condition, basically helping the, the decay fungus really start to grow and, and take off there. So it's like I said, sycamore anthracnose is, is a little bit different than other anthracnose diseases for this reason. And as we just said, it spends most of its life cycle um, in the, uh, the branch of the tree. And um, when you see a, a full-size infested um, tree, or infected tree rather, I keep screaming my infected and infested today. Um, so uh, basically, sycamore anthracnose is found where you find sycamore trees, right? Um, as I mentioned, where I live, right about here, you can see we're out of the native range of sycamores, and yet sycamores are still planted as landscape trees here. And actually, one of our, our climbers at the, uh, the very first slide that was up, uh, our guy Paul Shanke, who has the big burly beard, who is in the background of that title slide, he has a very large sycamore in his backyard, and that tree has sycamore anthracnose. And it's amazing because there probably isn't another sycamore tree within 10 miles of his house, and yet, it has sycamore anthracnose. So again, any um, um, you know uh, um, foliar diseases are obviously distributed by wind. So if the wind is blowing there, there's a good chance that you can uh, you can get the disease there as well. So um, what type of uh, plants is it, um, um, does it affect? Uh, the, the best one is, of course, the American sycamore. The London plane trees tend to be a little bit more resistant to it, um, as well as the oriental plane tree. Sycamore, um, or California sycamore, is also very susceptible to this. So you really see this disease very prominently sort of through the mid-Atlantic into Pennsylvania, um, into Ohio, and then um, really again in California. So in California, it became, like, it's, it's enough of an issue where I actually, when I'm out there from a distance, I use the witch's brooming effect on the sycamores is how I can identify that it's a sycamore from a distance. Um, it, just from its silhouette, you can tell, because it's that common on them. <clears throat> the, uh, like I said, the, the, the way that it 
enters the plant is by spores landing on the leaves. They germinate on the leaf. The fungus begins to grow inside the leaf, and that's where you start to get these necrotic spots um, developing on the leaves. And um, as the uh, Here's my little, look at that fancy graphic explaining what I just said. <laughs> so the spores enter through the uh, through the leaves there, and then well the spores enter on the surface of the leaf, then it grows, and as it's growing, you can follow the line there and it starts to grow into the twig where it sets up and um, uh, and starts to form these cankers. So this disease has a couple different stages to it. Um, there's you know they're sort of identified as the leaf blight stage, the twig blight stage, the bud blight stage. Um, Rather than getting into too much of that, you can kind of understand basically the process of what's going on. It's really we have um, we have the the disease more or less starting on the foliage and growing its way into the twigs. Once it grows its way into the twigs, um, by the time that happens, we actually start to see defoliation starting on these trees. So the tree will leaf out normally in the springtime. Um, infection period occurs, and by midsummer, these trees are dropping leaves left and right. And because of the cycle of this disease, um, and actually the way that sycamores grow, they actually start to refoliate um, later in the year. And a lot of times that's actually when we recommend doing our, our treatments for these. So basically, if you didn't get in the, um, the, the early part of the season, we basically tell you to wait until the trees begin to refoliate. And um, um, at that point, A, the, um, the, the tree you're setting it up for success the following year, and then also we're getting conditions where the macro infusion treatments go quite a bit faster. If you try doing them in the middle of the summer when the trees look the worst, they're going to be very slow uptake times. And I have spent some long hours sitting next to a sycamore tree that was not moving at all. <laughs> so, um, so this is during the, uh, the um, the, the defoliated period here. So this photo is taken about probably, I guess, by the rest of the, the stuff going on there, probably about you know June, July. So these trees leafed out fine in the spring. Um, then the, uh, the, the leaf stage really started to take off. All these leaves fell off. And now we basically wait for these trees to refoliate before we'd come in to try to do any type of management on them. Uh, the, um, the, the twig blight stage is really the most sort of destructive part of, of, of sycamore anthracnose and, and why it um, differentiates itself from these other um, foliar diseases like, you know, for example, oak anthracnose or, or ash anthracnose. Um, as it forms these cankers on the, um, on the twigs there, they um, start to form the, 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 the witch's branch or sorry, the witch's brooms and partly it's because the fungus is actually killing off the tips of the of the uh, of the, the branch and causing a, a burst of growth to start occurring below where that canker is formed, which is why we get these characteristic uh, witches branches, uh, witches brooms forming. <clears throat> you know the 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 appearance of these trees is probably what prompts people to opt for treatment. More so than like, you know, Dutch elm disease is a straight up fatal disease. If, if you have an elm tree and it's of value to you and you're in an area where Dutch elm disease is common, you treat a healthy tree to, to keep it alive. With sycamore anthracnose, nobody's preventing, nobody's treating these trees preventively. We're always basically called in when the trees look like this, right? Um, this is when a homeowner was finally prompted to, to, to take action on it. And there's a couple of things to, to, to take note of. For one, you got to understand, like basically, what's that tree going to look like, even if you if you fully save it, right? Um, or prevent the the, the fungus from um, from um, causing any further deformation of the the appearance of it. And also, the way that um, the the witches branches have formed, or which you think witches branches, <laughs> witches brooms have formed, you know, they're not going to fall off anytime soon. So if that's something that the homeowner is really concerned about, physically going in and pruning out the uh, the witches brooms is is another practice that um, that a lot of people employ if they really want to improve the appearance of the tree. Um, the uh, the um, the shoot blight is is really no different than than the the twig blight um, phase that we were just looking at. It looks a lot like frost injury. This is what happens to the trees right after um, the trees leaf out in the spring, and then when they begin to um, to form all these dead spots on the on the brand, on the leaves, and then begin to fall off. The reason the, the twig blight, where it's forming the the witch's brooms, is the most um, deforming stage. This to the tree's health is the most destructive stage because obviously leaves are a pretty important part to a tree's biology, right? If during the middle of summer it's um, 
its photosynthetic capabilities are significantly reduced, this is the one that really has the greatest impact on the tree's overall health. Um, so being an anthracnose, there is an option to come in and basically spray the tree in the springtime to, um, to prevent the, um, the, the spores that land on the, um, on the leaves from germinating and causing the, um, the leaf infection. However, the leaf infections are only part of, the, you know, again, this is a different type of anthracnose than, say, like ash anthracnose or oak anthracnose, right? With those, all we do is come in and spray them with a foliar fungicide, improves the look of the leaves, and the trees look great for the rest of the season. With sycamore anthracnose, if you come in and are only treating the, um, the, the foliar symptoms, um, there's a good chance we're still going to have the other parts of this, you know, because you're not usually going to get 100% coverage. So the trees will still get these cankers on them, and the cankers, like I said, will become the source for more of the inoculum, so that way the trees look worse and worse and worse every year. So this is actually why we... Um, we treat these trees with uh, with Arbortect. So um, the treating trees with Arbortect for sigma and anthracnose actually goes back. Some of the first research papers on it were published in '82 and '83. Um, so it's it's been around for quite a while. Um, it's one that because of the, the cost of it, the, the the time it takes, it's one that really high value trees are the ones that that people are um, are interested in in treating for, um, and also trees in in you know like high um, high visibility areas. Um, now, when we're treating with Arbortect, what Arbortect is doing is Arbortect is going to prevent the formation of those cankers, right? So the leaf stage, you might actually still see leaf symptoms on the tree um, because Arbortect won't actually prevent that um, spore from germinating on the leaf and causing some of the, the dead spots on the leaves. However, um, it will prevent the formation of those cankers. So over time, the trees will greatly increase in their, or greatly improve in their aesthetics because you're not going to have that source of, of inoculum right there on the tree. Um, but like I said, you might still see, it's not like every leaf on this tree is going to be completely perfect, but you step back and look at it and it's a significant um, difference in, in appearance. You know, here's an um, older photo, um, like I said, there's, you know, treatments on these trees going back um, 30 years now. Um, and even though if we were to get up close on here, we'd probably find some from some necrotic spots on these leaves looking like they have anthracnose. Um, this photo was taken two years after treatment was performed. And obviously our control tree is our untreated tree here. Um, so the tree has, has greatly improved in its, in its uh, aesthetic and just canopy fullness. And just think about you know, the photosynthetic rate of these two trees here. Um, it's, it's a no-brainer that obviously this one is doing um, quite a bit better on the, on the left than the right. Um, our, our key distinctions to sort of understand about sycamore anthracnose and, and you know, Arbortech treatments is, again, sycamore anthracnose is entering through the leaves, moving into those twigs to form these cankers. The cankers become the source for more spores, so the infection becomes worse year after year. Arbortech will prevent the formation of those cankers, and this note here about appearance greatly improves two years after treatment, that's because, say, I've got a tree that is heavily infested, or infested, infected this year, right? Um, it's defoliated, and I'm going to wait until this fall, and I'm going to treat that tree with Arbortech this fall. Next spring, when that tree leaves out, it's still going to have cankers on it because the cankers formed this year. So next year, my homeowner might not see a great improvement in the character of this tree because there's still going to be um, locally sourced spores spreading around the rest of that canopy. The following year, because next year now, the tree won't be able to have those cankers form. So if I wait till the following year, that's when you're really going to see the, the, the dramatic Im improvement in the appearance of the tree. And just like with um, uh, Dutch elm disease, uh, Arbortect is effective for three years in these trees before needing to be reapplied. <clears throat> so this presentation wasn't really about the, the physical process of doing macro infusion. So rather than going through a step-by-step, -step, here's how you do macro infusion, I literally summed it up on one slide. It just If you've never seen it before, it's literally we excavate around the root flare of a tree. We drill in to the uh, root flare. Uh, we use a series of tubing and T's um, to... Um, so these two photos should be reversed. <clears throat> uh, we use a series of, of tubing and T's to basically uh, introduce a large volume of solution and the fungicide into, into the vascular system of the tree. 
Um, we do have, you know, if you're interested, we do have um, training videos and application guides on macro infusion. But like I said, the, the, the point of this presentation today wasn't to get into the nuts and bolts of the different steps of macro infusion. But in case you hadn't ever seen it before, I'm going to set up at least one slide. Um, so switching gears a bit from how we do disease management, this is more about how we actually do the, the operations of sending crews out to do these, these treatments in mass. So if you're just doing one tree at a time, you basically show up and do, do this. But most of the time, our crews, like I said, we've got, mm, I think, six crews out today doing macro infusion treatments. Um, how, we, how we do this, um, Rainbow Tree Care does probably more macro infusion treatments than just about anybody in the country, including some of the big um, national organizations of, or national companies. And partly it's because we've been able to find a way to make the efficiency of it work where we hire um, a whole bunch of um, college kids, basically, for the summertime. Um, we send them out in teams, and the teams always have two vans. So what these guys will do is you can see this is the first job of the day. There's a tree down on the boulevard here, and there's a tree up here on the property, and then I believe there was two trees in the backyard of this property as well. So pretty typically what these guys will do is they'll show up two, guy, or two vans um, to the first job site. Oftentimes it's uh, three um, people and uh, two vans. So these guys will show up to the first job site and everybody will get that tree set up. As soon as these trees are going, two of the, the team members will hop into one of the vans and drive to the next job site. They'll start getting that job site set up. And as this person, um, you know, cleans up um, finishes up his macro infusion treatments, um, he'll swing by and pick up the second person and that third person's already moved on to, to the next job site. So we kind of do this leapfrogging uh, approach and by doing this um, we have a, um, a system where basically these teams of, of three people can do anywhere between eight and twelve full-size trees in a day um, and, um, and that's how we're able to keep the labor costs low enough where um, we can treat enough of these trees in a season where, like I said, we can actually be profitable at this and, um, and create an environment where we can treat as many trees as possible. Rainbow probably, I think this year, we're treating something like 2,300 uh, elm trees alone. And then you start counting in all the other type of injection treatments we're doing, like um, um, our, of course, ash tree treatments, our um, uh, oak wilt, and um, come fall time, doing chlorosis treatments as well. So, um, so setting it up this way, this little graphic here just gives you a real, you know, rough idea of how basically having more than one um, set of application equipment can greatly increase your productivity. So you can see if basically I've got one application kit, I do my setup and I start my macro infusion. When you start the macro infusion, depending upon the tree, it's anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and 20 minutes to actually inject all that solution into the tree and then do a cleanup and then get to your next job site and move on. So if we're doing this um, leapfrogging approach, we can basically get one tree set up and then go on to the next tree and get that tree set up. And now we've got uh, a couple more, um, you know, you can kind of see as we add um, number of kits, uh, we can add to the number of, of jobs that a crew can get done in a day. Like I said, this would be our, our crews of, of three people in two vans are getting, um, it said, anywhere between eight and 12 trees uh, completed in a day. So it greatly increases your profitability per man hour by being able to not just have crew members sitting around waiting for an hour to then move on to the next job site to have them sit there and wait for an hour. So um, due to macro infusion, um, we, we always keep somebody sitting at the, the job site. This isn't the kind of thing you ever want to uh, walk away from. So this isn't one of these where you can just set it and come back three hours later to come pick up your stuff. We always have a person sitting there. Um, those people sitting there, um, they you know read books and they read magazines and these days they, they look at their phones. But another big thing they're doing is they're also communicating with any homeowners. People stop by all the time and go, what you doing? And so our staff is trained to how to explain what they're doing for the elm tree in, in a two second conversation with the guy walking his dog. So not only are we out there in the community helping protect the trees, but our staff is actually out there helping advocate for why you'd even want to do this and what's the process and people are interested in it. So um, in its own little weird way, our Elm crews are actually one of our best marketing tools because there's a guy just standing there next to a tree and people pull up, roll down their window and go, what you doing? 
Um, so having staff members that are, you know, you know, informed about what they're doing and, and being able to communicate with folks, you know, it's a um, a great little marketing tool as well as being able to, you know, to efficiently get these trees treated so that we can remain profitable on it. So. Um, if you are interested, um, we actually have um, some posters that were created um, that we still have quite a few of them left. So I can either email one to you or I'd be happy to send you these. Uh, we have one on sycamore anthracnose and we have one on Dutch elm disease. Um, the version on your screen, I'm sure you can't read that well, but they're kind of informative. They actually give the whole um, the background of how the disease works and then the you know some information about why we do protection in the way that we do. So um, if these are of, of value to you, let uh, Peter or myself know by either typing it into that um, questions box or um, you know typing it into an, an email to us and we'll get some of these sent out to you. They're great to hang up in crew rooms or you know by your PHC shed, things like that. So um, so if you are of interest, uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, to get some of these posters out to you and um, out of our storeroom. <laughs> So um, with that, um, I'll actually do a quick plug for our next upcoming webinars. Uh, the next two coming up are good ones. The uh, Growth Management Tools to Help Trees is coming up um, Tuesday of next week. And talking about air spades and improving soil and root health is going to be next Thursday's presentation. So um, hopefully you guys are finding these of value to you beyond just getting a free CEU. Hopefully they're stuff that you can take some information from and, and help, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, do things in your own business with. Um, we really enjoy putting these on, so we appreciate people's feedbacks as well. So if there's things you'd like to see, topics you'd like to see, or ways that you think we can improve these presentations for you on your end, we are um, we are delighted when people reach out to us, even if they're all just uh, criticisms about what they'd like to not see again next time. We absolutely love getting any kind of feedback. So. Um, check out the upcoming uh, schedule on uh, treecarescience.com and get yourself registered for those. Uh, if you have uh, any questions or wanted to reach out to me directly, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to, to field any uh, uh, emails from you. Uh, with that, I will uh, bid you adieu and have a great safe day out there and hopefully we will talk to you soon.